Hi everyone, I'm Mathilde Collin. I'm the CEO and co-founder of France. I started this company because I wanted more people to come to work and be happy. And at the beginning of this year, I started a quest and tried to understand way better what companies can do to make their employees more happy and find more meaning. And so as part of that, I've been interviewing people with interesting perspective on finding meaning, happiness at work. And so I'm very happy to have Justin Ken today. Uh, Justin is the CEO and co-founder of Atrium. He has started a few companies before, one of them being Justin TV that became Twitch, was sold to Amazon for, I think, a billion dollars in 2014. And 2014 is also the year I met Justin, as he was a partner at Y Combinator. And very few people know, but I don't think I would have been into YC without Justin. So I don't think I would be here today without him. Um, now, as much as I respect what Justin has done as uh, an entrepreneur and as a business person, what I admire most about him is his transparency and candor and vulnerability uh, when he talks about finding happiness in this challenging journey of being an entrepreneur. And that's what I want to talk about today. So Justin, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited. Great. So the first topic I want to talk about is this concept of meaningful work. So it seems like more and more people are not looking for just a job or just a career. They want a calling or they want more meaning in your work. And so the first question I have for you is, do you find your job meaningful? Yeah, I, I think I do. I don't think that was always the case. I think a lot of times I didn't find my job meaningful. It was just a means to an end. You know, I wanted to have a big company or I wanted to be a famous startup founder. So I had to do all these things I didn't like to do. Yeah. Uh, the concept that really opened up my job and turned it into the best job I've ever had uh, was the concept of living in your zone of genius, uh, AKA the things that uh, you love to do that really give you energy. Yes. Most people, founders and really everyone else, end up in their zone of competence, which is the things that they uh, really don't love to do, but they're really good at and they think they need to do. And so they create a job they're really good at, but they're miserable in. Yeah. And uh, even CEOs end up there where they're, they're in a spot where, you know, they're like, I have to do all these things because my company won't survive without it. I have to do the sales. I have to manage the product, whatever, you know, they don't like to do, but they're good at. And uh, oftentimes when they, you know, when, when they get stuck in that position, they feel like they're trapped. Yeah. So I've definitely lived there in my past. And when I learned this concept of like living in your zone of genius, I went through and explicitly said, what are all my areas of responsibility? Yep. And which ones do I love doing? Which ones give me energy? And what are the ones that don't? And for the ones that don't, maybe I can find somebody who uh, actually, it's in their zone of genius to, to do these things and have like true 100% responsibility for these things. Yep. And that's what I did. And my work became a lot more meaningful to me after yes. that. And how do you think you came to that realization? So why didn't you do that in your previous jobs? And what made it special in this specific opportunity? Yeah, so, uh, well, I spent 15 years not doing that, so I might be re in the remedial class, but yes. you know, I really learned it because of an outside coach. So I have this CEO coach, uh, you know, Matt Mochari, and Matt, uh, really the zone of genius concept is from Matt. It's not, I didn't make it up. He, yeah. he told me about it and helped me kind of uh, do, take the first steps by doing an audit of my calendar. So I went through my past three weeks calendar together with him and he was like, did, what was this meeting? Did it give you energy or did it drain you? And then I just circled every, you know, everything that gave me energy in yeah. blue and everything that took away energy in red. And then I tried to figure out how to not do any of the red things. Yeah. What was the percentage of green? I did the same exercise, so I'm curious. Yeah. I think it was probably like 50-50, okay. roughly. And what is it now? Um, well, I need to do another audit. I don't have a recent audit, but I would say that it's probably like 85 to 90% blue now. Yeah. I didn't have green pen, so. <laughs> Blue's green. Um, so wh one thing that I find interesting is you're in this position where you're a CEO, and so you got the opportunity to meet with Matt Mochari, which, which is great, and I got the opportunity, is amazing. Um, and I also think that it's easier for CEOs and founders to find meaning because they know exactly why they're working on what they're working on. Yep. They usually care about it because otherwise they wouldn't work as hard. And so what I'm, I've been curious about is how can companies and CEOs make sure that that's also happening for their employees? So do you think that employees at Atrium f find their job meaningful? 
Um, I think some of them do, and yeah. some of them probably don't yet. Yes. You know, I would say yet, right? Yeah. Um, I think that Atrium started off as pretty average, normal company from an employee culture and workplace, you know, happiness standpoint. Yeah. Let's say two years, we're two years old, so two yeah. years ago. And I think we have been investing a lot in it in the past year, and so it's gone, you know, we've improved a lot, but there's still a lot to be improved, to be honest. Um, I see my job as kind of the primary facilitator to help everyone in the company live in their zone of genius because I have this coach, yeah. right? I have this outside coach, a lot of outside resources, training, et cetera. And I've been very blessed to get those things. But you're right, it is hard for um, even executives on, on a team in a company, let alone, you know, kind of everybody else in the company uh, to get that same kind of training. So that's really what I'm doing for the company. So I actually went and, and went through all my executives. We went through their AORs and we said, what's in your zone of genius, what's not? Yeah. And then how do you, with your team, right? Because each of these executives is really running their own team and, um, within their organization. How do you like transfer the responsibilities you're not excited about that don't give you energy to someone else where they might actually jump at the level of responsibility? Yeah. And um, we're going through that process now, and I think it's it's already been very freeing for those team members. And my goal is really to bring that culture and that mindset all the way down the organization. Yeah. And I think that you know you might think that for someone very junior, like a IC, you know, individual contributor role, who just started in the company, they're like, you know, doing customer support. Yeah. Right. Something where they don't have a lot of control over uh, how they do their job. Yeah. Maybe. Um, I think you can still do that zone of genius exercise, and, and they can really, if they're being honest with themselves, think, Am I, do I like this, love this job? Do I love the things that I'm doing? Do they yeah. give me energy or not? And if the answer is they're not, now maybe the job can't really be adapted 100% for them because it's, you know, um, it's a job you need maybe like a thousand CSRs or something right. like that, right? But maybe it's not a good fit for them, right? Yes. And if they're being truly honest with themselves, I think that will be, um, make people be very free. Right, right. So, so if I understand correctly, one thing, the exercise that you've done in order to find what your zone of genius, then you have your execs do it. Yeah. So did they all print their calendar and highlight it in green what gave them energy and red what didn't give them energy? Yeah, so we did the calendar exercise and yeah. the second thing we do is we explicitly write out, we do a collaborative like areas of responsibility yes. for AOR. So like our exec team will say, what's the ex areas of responsibility for the CTO? Yep. And everyone in a document will type out what they think the areas of responsibility for the CTR. We'll aggregate it, uh, and then we would go through. I would go through with the CTO and, and say, "Hey, do you like doing this? Do you yeah. love doing this? Does it give you energy? Yes. Okay, it's your responsibility. No. Okay, we need to find someone else to do it. Yes. And then all the way down through the list. Again, what happens when you're at the bottom of the list and there are still things on a calendar that are red, and then there is no one else to do this? Is it okay if? No one does it, or because there is a business reality, which is the work needs to be done, yeah. then everyone should accept some percentage of their job not being their zone of genius. Yeah, I think reality is it's very hard to live at 100% yes. in your zone of genius. But I think that it can be a tool to teach you, what do I want to figure out how to not do tomorrow? You know, I might have to yes. do it today, but what do I want to figure out how to not do it tomorrow? And yep. there's many ways that could happen. For example, I felt that I needed to still be in a certain set of review meetings, right? Even though I, I didn't feel like they were in my zone of genius. So uh, I really asked myself, why do I not feel energized by this meeting? And figured out there were some structural changes, yep. um, some work that we could shift to the pre-meeting part yep. uh, that would make it be much more productive for me. Yes. And so that's a way to like both do it, but also change it so that it's like more high energy. Yep. Or you know, maybe you're saying, I need to do these sets of things for my organization, and there's no one else to do them, but I'm going to try to figure out how to hire someone or shift those responsibilities onto somebody else in the organization uh, tomorrow. You yes, know? makes sense. Um, so now, a topic we may disagree on, I don't know yet, is um, as I was thinking about you know, meaning in your work, I've found that there is a difference between uh, finding your job meaningful and being happy doing your job. Um, so an example of this would be, let's say you're a doctor in a war zone, yeah. like you might find your job very meaningful, but you might not be as happy as you could possibly be just because you're stressed, you don't sleep as much or whatever. So the first question would be, do you think there is a difference between finding your job meaningful and being happy doing your job? Yeah, absolutely. Great. So now some people make the trade off of, you know, they give up some happiness for meaning. Do you think that it's okay sometimes to give up some happiness for meaning? Yeah, of course. Do you I, do I that? 
I think optimizing for your own happiness is just one axis of yes. like something you could do in your life. Yeah. Um, do I do that? Have I sacrificed my happiness for meaning? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that you know any sort of startup, but Atrium especially. You know, Atrium is taking on the legal industry. It's a huge industry, um, and it's a really complex problem. Yeah. And uh, there are a lot of I think easier companies to start. Yes. Uh, with less moving pieces, but. Um, you know, I'm interested in the complexity and interested in uh, making a big dent. And so I think that uh, tackling this problem is meaningful to me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but it is more complicated, which means there's more problems, more yep. things to coordinate, more things that can go wrong. Yeah. Uh, which is a, you know, potentially a short term blow to your happiness. Yes. Although I actually think that um, if you really, or for me, if I, you know, as I've kind of remove my attachment to outcomes, I can live in that situation where there's a lot of painful things happening or uncertainty yeah. or whatever and still be pretty happy. Do you try to teach that to your employees as well? I try to. I think that it's kind of one of those things where everyone has to come to it on their own. Yeah. I think that a lot of the tools for being happier in whatever situation you're in and not being attached to a certain outcome to drive your happiness, uh, you can tell people and I have yeah. heard other people tell me but until I was ready it was like kind of falling on deaf ears yeah and, and do you feel like the responsibility of leaders and companies um, is to provide any meeting and or do you think their responsibility is also to help them as individuals be happy or not I think you well I can only really speak for myself yes. I feel that I have the responsibility to do both yeah the meaning is like why you should care yeah and work hard and Put in effort, right? Why? Why do you actually care about solving this problem? Yeah. The happiness is like, why is this going to be a sustainable situation for you? Yeah. I'm not interested in building a company in the traditional Silicon Valley way where people, you know, do a two-year tour of duty and then they burn out and they have to go on sabbatical for six months because yeah. they're so they were so stressed, right? Yeah. That might produce a lot of economic value, but um, it's just not the kind of place I want to work at. I'm particularly interested in building a company where. Uh, people feel like they can continue working there for a long time because they continue to grow, they continue to get opportunities to learn, and they're happy. They yes. might not be like the most happiest people in the world, and I can't really control that, but they're happy and they don't think like they're not constantly torturing themselves about like how do I get do something else? Yeah. Because I don't think that's sustainable. Yeah, yeah. So one one thing that I've realized is that there is a lot of people talking about how they can be more happy, how they can find meaning. Yep. And I don't think there is a lot that's written about what companies can do to provide this happiness and meaning to their employees. And so you mentioned that at Atrium, one of the things you do is helping people find their zone of genius, making sure that they live inside this zone of genius. Yep. Is there any other thing that you do to provide this meaning and for people to understand why they're working on what they're working on and why it matters? Yeah, I think that it's nothing revolutionary. It's the same things that you have at any well-functioning company. Yep. So it's what are the co corporate values? Like what are the things that you guys value as a group? The second thing is having a mission. Like where are yep. we going towards? The third thing is having goals. Yep. It's really important that you have short-term goals that people are rallied around so that they know that they're making progress towards something. Yes. And they can see, measure whether their uh, work product contributes towards that, that goal. Uh, those are probably the main things that are... That are How do you make sure that everyone at the company knows about the mission? Well, we repeat it at every all hands. We repeat all the values, repeat the mission, repeat our uh, yearly objectives, uh, and we repeat our quarterly objectives Great. at every all hands, which happens every two weeks. Great. What about, what do you do as a company to help people be happier? So I know that there yeah. is a ton of things that you've done and that you've written about. Um, meditation is one of them. Having less notifications on your phone is another one, having a therapist, exercising, diets, many others. So what are the things that you try to share with your employees on how to be happier as an individual? Yeah, so the first thing is um, we really are trying to roll out conscious leadership at our company. So this book called The 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership, and it effectively describes a set of values for how to um, operate a company in a way that it's coming from a place of love instead of fear. Yeah. And um, I won't go too deep into what those are, but uh, they really 
resonated with me. You know, the top three are kind of, um, the first three are taking 100% responsibility for what's going on around you, approaching everything in an open and curious mindset, and then being able to bring your whole emotional self to work. Yeah. And so uh, we do a lot of things to implement that cu culture in our company. All of our um, management operations team, that's the kind of HR team internally at Atrium, has uh, been trained as coaches. Uh, they did a coaches training. Uh, they help coach the managers. We do a mandatory manager training. We're rolling out like all company trainings for conscious leadership. Uh, I do a book club every month about uh, you know about the book. Yeah. And so we do a lot of things to implement conscious leadership uh, at the company. And then the second thing is I really try to be an example of um, you know the type of I try to talk about the things that have really made a big impact for me. So I talk about meditation all the time. You know, we start uh, meetings now with like conscious breathing or yoga stretch. Um, I try to um, model talking about my emotions and being able to name my emotions, which is a big uh, kind of a meaningful step for me to become more comfortable with whatever was going on, you know, whatever emotions I was feeling. Um, so I try to model that in meetings and in conversations uh, yep. for people. Uh, we have a therapy benefit uh, for our team. Uh, I talk openly about how uh, ther you know, therapy has been helpful to me. So those are some of the some of the things we try to do. Um, nice. What do you have examples where you've named an emotion? Yeah. At work. Definitely, there are a lot. You know, so uh, one example that sticks out in, to mind was uh, we had like a monthly business review meeting a couple months ago, and uh, I was feeling bored. You know, boredom is an emotion. It's kind of a form of anger and um, instead, you know, normally in a professional setting, you might think, oh, you should not say that, right? Yeah. If you say, I'm bored, it's gonna be, um, you know, throw people off, they're gonna feel attacked, uh, it's gonna be not constructive, it's not professional. That's probably what I would have done in the past is just like not said I was bored and just kind of zoned out. Yeah. Instead, here I said, you know, I, I decided one of the commitments in this 15 Commitments book is the, is candor or not withholding, so I was like, okay, I'm just gonna say it. And I said, hey, I raised my hand, I, you know, I, I wanna tell you I'm bored right now. And then everybody's first instinct, they were like shocked. They were, oh my God, CEO's bored, like this is terrible, right? And I said like, look, no, it's not that you guys are doing anything wrong, you're doing your jobs, I think you're doing a great job. I think that my boredom is a reflective of something is wrong in this meeting. Yep. Like we're actually reviewing the wrong things. I think we're stuck in the tactical when we haven't really addressed the strategic uh, goals here for over six months and we should actually go back and you know, you two, the leaders of this group should actually think about what the strategic uh, goals are here and then come back next month and that we can figure out how to use this brain trust of executives to figure out how to make, to help you be more successful at your strategic goals. Yeah. And so um, everybody left at that point and um, you know, the next day uh, one of the leaders came to me and said, hey, that was, you know, actually that helped us have a really productive conversation. Because the point is like everybody knew that I was bored. I don't, I'm not very good at hiding my emotions and other people were like on their phones and shit. Yeah. And so, you know, people knew that something was wrong, but it was kind of like nobody was saying it. Yeah. You know, and so by being able to name it, and your emo your emotions are a signal, right? And if you're listening to that signal and you're able to say it in a non-violent, non-confrontational way that doesn't put blame on somebody else for creating those emotions in you, yeah. um, then you're able to actually have a productive conversation about the underlying problems that may exist. Whereas, you know, in the I'm ignoring my emotions state, which is most of how professional business works in the world, uh, you're just throwing out that signal and you may never address the underlying issues. Yeah. Well, I'm really inspired by all, all you're saying and I think it's great because people at Atrium can see the benefit of it. I care a ton also about making sure that we have a culture where people are happy find meaning. How do you think it can not be the two of us but every company in the world can obsess over these topics? For me, what brought me to this is learning from other people's example. Yeah. So learning from coaches, you know, learning from Matt, learning from other experiences that I had. And I really think, you know, you can read it in a book, but it doesn't really resonate until you actually see examples in action. Yeah. So for me, the, the way that I think about it is how can I build my company up and be successful and build it to a large organization and ha with these values so that all the people who work at Atrium will be models for this behavior and this way of like leadership in the future, whether they're inside of Atrium or outside. And, you know, people go on and they do great things. And yeah. I, wanna, I want them to be able to carry this with them for the rest of their lives. Well, thank you so much, Justin. I personally learned it, and I think companies can learn a lot from everything that was said, um, specifically, you know, I think reading the 15 commitments of conscious leadership and then training your team on conscious leadership. 
Number two is helping people find their zone of genius. Um, number three is just always caring about your personal happiness and all the tips that we've given. You can also read uh, the Feeling Good program of Justin Ken that states a lot of um, ideas on how to be happy. I will see you soon. Thank you so much again for being here. I hope you enjoyed it. Since you like naming your emotions, what's your emotion right now, Justin? I feel very happy. It's always a joy to see you, Matilda. Great. It's always a joy to see you too, Justin. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you.